So I'm super excited to get to share this morning. And you know, it's, um, it, it's interesting. It takes some pretty legitimate role reversals in our house for us to be able to get to this point, right? So um, usually when Sean asks me to speak, um, it typically means he'll give me a day or two of his typical study time to get to come to the office by myself and to get my study time done, which really up until this last year for him has meant that he works from home in his sweatpants, you know, on things that he can work on and, and still be interrupted, right? Things he can do with the noise of the kids running around, like graphic stuff or uh, website stuff, event planning, napping, that kind of thing. And so that's usually what it meant for him. But, but this year has been a little bit different with a four-month-old. And, um, you know, so coming into it, this first day I get to come to the office, I get to study, I got here, and, you know, my hands are free, right? For the first time in, like, five months, my hands, I have both hands to work. And so I come into the day, like, behind on life, everything, because I have a baby, and I knew that there were certain things, I just need to get these things lined up, and then I can clear the desk, and then I can study. And so that's what I did. I got those things done with two hands, and I, I got those all lined up, and then I cleared the desk, and I could get some study done. And usually, though... When he asks me to speak, I usually come home from that first day and I'm saying, man, what you do is hard. Like, I've been sitting at that desk for hours. I've been reading. I've been staring at a computer screen. I have the entire Bible to choose from. And I like maybe have an idea and maybe a verse to share. I don't know how you do this every week. That's usually what it, what, it comes, what it comes down to. This time, I came back and I was feeling so accomplished. So I walk in the house and I'm like, Sean, how was your day? And he's like, well, Faye has not napped all day. I've maybe gotten an hour of work in. I really, I'm sorry, I really wanted to have the dishes done for you when you got home, but I've been holding this fussy baby all day and I love our kids, but I don't know how you do that every day. So, you know, I think it's healthy for our marriage to have these role reversals every now and then, don't you? So, it's good for us. But I can safely say that I believe both of us prefer the roles we play on a regular basis. Is that safe to say? We both prefer that. But it's fun, and I'm glad to get to do this this morning. But, you know, so that first day that Sean was home, and I was in the office studying, you know, I came home and found, you know, Faye hadn't napped all day. She's, she's about to be five months old, and she just, she just wouldn't nap. And so he spent basically the whole time that I was gone, he spent the whole time trying to get her to sleep. And just as soon as he would get her to sleep, you know, you, you kind of transfer her to the bed and then tiptoe out the room. And as soon as he would get out the room, almost immediately she would wake up. And she was completely unrested, and she was mad, right? She was mad. She was not happy. And that's what happened every time he tried to get her to sleep. So the whole day is spent trying to get this baby who needs this rest, trying to get her to rest, and she just would not do it. And he just got to the end of the day, and he said, I think she just rests better when she knows you're near. And I think it's true. I mean, it might, I think it's true for a lot of babies, but it's definitely true for this one, that she just rests better when she knows that I'm near. And I get that. And, but have you ever felt tired like that, though? Like you're just so tired. Like you're so tired that you feel like you have all these needs. But none of the needs are being met because what you really need is you just need rest, right? Like physical rest, rest mentally, uh, spiritually, emotionally, like you just need rest. And so as I'm preparing this this week, I just really kind of realized that I think that we are a lot like, more like Faye than we even know. And just like Faye was, was, uh, is able to rest so much more and so, be- so much better, rest more, so much better, when I am knowing I am near, I believe that our ability to find true rest is directly related to our proximity to our Savior. Would you agree with that? that our ability to find true rest is directly related to our proximity to our Savior. So that's what I want to talk about today. But now that I've done all that, i got to have to find my place in here somewhere. So, in the, okay, so, so in the last few weeks, we've been hearing about um, stories about how God was with people, right? He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. We heard about how God has been with Pastor Grady through this year of of cancer and cancer treatments. We heard how God is with uh, Pastor Phil and Terry through job uncertainty and through just daily quiet time with the Lord. 
Um, just this week, I was driving down 27th Street at 4.30, so pretty much, so traffic time. I'm driving down 27th Street, and in my rearview mirror, I see this van, like, driving off the side of the road, off the road, back on the road, off the road, back on the road, into the other lane, stopping when they should have been going, uh, ran the red light at 27th and Superior, and I just saw this van. I thought, something is wrong, and I called, I called the police. A few people called the police. We pulled over. The car finally stopped with this woman basically asleep at the wheel. Turns out she had a terribly low blood sugar. Okay, so the ambulance comes, and she goes in the ambulance. We're trying to call her husband and everything. Well, I get a phone call a couple hours later because we'd used my phone to call her husband, and she, you know, she's talking. She's completely normal. She's, you know, having conversation, and she's telling me that she, the last thing she remembers was getting in her car at 27th and Pine Lake, and she woke up in an ambulance at 27th and Superior, and she had no idea how she got there. She's basically asleep at the wheel. And I was just able to tell her, ma'am, God was with you. At traffic time, I know I saw you run at least one red light. You were on and off the road. And she didn't hit a single person. She didn't hit a single car. God was with her, right? Yeah. And you know, these, we hear these stories like this. God is with somebody through cancer. God with somebody in, in job struggles. Um, you know, when we hear these stories like that, when we hear stories about um, this you know, young woman who gives birth on a cold December night in a stable in Bethlehem, that God was with her when we hear stories like that. When we hear stories like God being with a woman on a cold December morning in a van in the parking lot of the hospital in Lincoln, which is a story I heard this week, when we hear that story, we don't need to be surprised, right? Because God is Emmanuel. His, it's in his name. So from the moment that his birth was announced, the angel said he'll be called Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. So from the time he was conceived, his name has rang true, right? He is here. He is with us. It's in his name. It's in his character. So we don't have to doubt it, right? But if, if, if God is with us, and if our ability to find rest is directly related to our proximity to our Savior, then why do we live these lives of anxiety and unrest, right? Why are we so tired all the time? Why are we um, just burned out and worn out from the uh, living a life of just trying to do all the right things? If God is with us, and if our ability to rest is, is being close to him, then why are we living these lives of unrest, I think that if we want to experience the rest that God offers, it's not just about God being with us, but it's about us drawing near to him. Would you agree? So let's read this. Let's, you can open your Bibles if you have them or your phone app or whatever it is that you do or your memory. Some of you got it right up here. Okay. Uh, but we're going to read from Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. We're going to start there. A little bit of context. Um, Jesus had just been... Doing, giving these woes, woes to all these cities, okay? So he had kind of just been like denouncing these cities where he had done several miracles, um, but the people there, it was these cities, they were full of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they just refused to acknowledge that he was God, acknowledge what he had done, acknowledge their sin, and repent from it, okay? So that's kind of what leads into this story is Jesus is telling them, you know, he's saying woe to all these people, and then he kind of just takes this sharp right turn and starts praying a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And that's where we pick up. It says, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your grace, gracious will. So he denounces these cities for being unbelieving, for being unrepentant. And then he immediately turns to thanksgiving to God. Thank you, God, that you have not revealed yourself to them, but to babes, right? Uh, thank you that that was your will. And it kind of, it reminds me of, uh, this has happened several times in our house when we decide we're going to do something fun for the kids and we'll tell one of them, hey, today we're going to take a trip or today we're going to go do this fun activity, whatever it is. And almost immediately and almost every time, the first question that comes out of their mouth is, can I go tell my sister? Can I go tell Ellie? Can I tell them what we're going to do? Because it brings them so much joy to be a part of that process. It brings them so much joy to get to be the ones to tell their sisters about something good that we have in store for them. And I get the picture that that's what Jesus is doing. So he's kind of saying, God, you, you know, these people, they have not turned, they have not repented, but thank you that you have not completely revealed yourself to them because I get to be a part of the process. Because read the next verse. 
It says, uh, yes, Father, with such a gracious will. Verse 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So, so he says, thank you that you have not completely revealed yourself, because no, and no one can know you unless they go through me. So I can't help but look at that and see that Jesus was saying, thank you that I get to be a part of that process. And now in the next verse, Jesus says, come. He says, come to me. So when we read this, when we read that, when we read this, we can know that Jesus, when he says come, he doesn't do it begrudgingly because he just thanked God for the opportunity. Okay? He just thanked God that he got to be a part of this process. So in this next verse, it says, verse 28, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's not begrudgingly. It's because he wants you to come. He's truly grateful for the opportunity to get to be a part of this process and to get to know you. And I just love that. I think that's good. So verse 28, again, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he invites us to come, all who are weary and burdened. Sometimes I think when we read this, we immediately go to my financial burden or my physical sickness or this relational burden that I have. Um, and I, I, do, I do know that God cares about that stuff, right? 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you, okay? So those kinds of things, absolutely he cares and he wants us to give them over to him. But I don't think that's what he's talking about here because remember he has just talked about these people who are so busy like trying to do the right stuff and the right thing that they don't recognize who he is and they can't get past their own sin to repent and to come to him. And so I think that's what he's talking about. I think he's talking less about the burden, the emotion, you know, the burdens that we bring to him. He's talking more about um, this idea of work, right? Because he uses the word yoke, which means work. Um, so I think it's more about coming, um, those of you who are burdened with, um, you know, the desire to do everything right, to do everything on your own, the burden of striving to maybe earn our salvation through the things that we do, that, which is ultimately the burden of knowing about Jesus, but not knowing him and not recognizing him. And that's who he's inviting to come. I think we can all relate to that at some point. So Again, we always, we, looked, we look at this verse, I do, until this week, I look at this verse, come to me, you who are burdened, and I'm going to take your burdens, and I'm going to give you my yoke, or whatever. He doesn't say anything about bringing the burdens. He just says, come to me, and I'll give you rest. And the words there literally mean, when it says, I'll give you rest, it literally means an intermission from labor. So he's not saying, come to me, give me your burdens, I'm going to take them away. He's saying, I'm going to give you a reprieve from the burden of those things, right? I'm going to give you a reprieve from the weight that they often are. So then he says, so he says, no one knows the father except the son. So you have to go to the son in order to get to know the father. And then he says, come to me and I'll give you rest. And he attributes or he, the rest that he offers is in the context of coming to him to get to know the father. You see that? It's not just about coming, handing a burden, and thus I am now restful. It's coming to Jesus to know the Father, and that's when he gives me rest. So the rest is in the coming to Jesus, but the rest is also in the knowing the Father. Um, <clears throat> I think sometimes we come to Jesus, we're burdened with all different ki- types of things, and um, we come to him, and what really is happening is he's in a heart of gratitude. He's thanking God that I get to be a part of bringing them and now pointing to you. Okay, so he doesn't take the burden, but he immediately points us to the Father. And you know what happens? We find rest. As Jesus points us to the Father, we find rest. Because when I come to Jesus, and when he teaches me about the Father, and I learn that God the Father is full of mercy, then it's very natural for me to then find rest from the shame that's associated with my sin. And when I come to Jesus and he points me to the Father and I learn that God the Father is loving, then I find rest from my loneliness. He didn't take it away, but I'm learning who the Father is and I find rest from that, a reprieve from the the burden of my loneliness. And when I come to Jesus and he points me to the Father and I learn that he's a conqueror, then I find rest from my fear. 
And when I come to him and I find uh, that he's forgiving, then I am able to freely forgive because how many of you know that a life of unforgiveness is very unrestful? Yes? So when I come to Jesus, I learn that about God the Father, then I find rest from that. Or when I come to Jesus and I find out that he's my provider, then I find rest from my uh, constant anxiety over my needs being met. When I come and I find that he's the prince of peace, I find rest from my anxiety. So do you see this here? It's not about coming to Jesus, giving him a burden, and then I am finding rest. I come to Jesus, he points me to the Father, and there I find the rest that he's offering. And this has um, it's never been so evident to me this whole process, as it was a few years ago. Um, and it was October of 2014, and we were hosting Dick and Mary Dungan. If you know Dick and Mary Dungan, he works with Grady at RMI, and they came, and then he spoke at Crossroads that weekend. And they've come, and they've stayed with us many, many times since then, but I think this was the first time. And so um, I couldn't tell you what he spoke about at Crossroads that morning, but I was so... Um, it stood out to me so much in our time that we spent with them just at the breakfast table and sitting on our couch drinking coffee. It was just, just really stood out to me how often that Dick said things like, well, the Lord showed me this. Or, yeah, you can come up, Pam. I'm really not going to talk as long as Sean does. <laughs> I told her to come up when I started talking about Dick and Mary, and now I'm talking. She's going, wait, you're almost done. Yes, I am. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, anyway, okay, so Dick and Mary are at a house, and, and, and just in these conversations with them, over and over, he says things like, well, the Lord showed me this, or God spoke to me about this, or I asked God about this, and he said this, and I was just like, wow, like, God's like talking to him, and everything he said, it was obvious, yeah, that is from God. And something in me started like just really wanting that. And, you know, my story is that I have walked with the Lord as long as I can remember. And by the grace of God, there has never been a season of my life where I've really just turned and walked from him. And thank God for that. But I found myself, however many years into my relationship with him, I found myself just like really desiring to know him in a deeper and more intimate way to where he would speak to me and I would hear his voice. And I think I was really longing for the rest that comes with that. And so, so Dick and Mary left and I just said, you know what, I'm going to do an experiment because I want that. I don't, I know he spends time with God. But I, I want that. I've spent time with God a lot and I don't have that. And so I decided every day in November uh, that year, every day in November, I was gonna, the first thing I was going to do is I was going to set my alarm early, which at the time for me was really hard because I'm a stay-at-home mom and we homeschool. So like, I hadn't set an alarm in years, except when I come on Sunday mornings, you know. So that was a big deal. Okay, but I'm going to set my alarm early because if you're, get, you know, if you're getting moms, if you're being woken up by your kids, then your day is starting when those kids wake you up. And it probably is not stopping till those kids are in bed. So I knew for me, if I was going to really spend this time with the Lord and dedicate that time to him, if I was going to do that, it was going to have to be early. So first thing I did was I set my alarm early. The second thing I decided was I am not going to look at anything until I've spent that time with him. Nothing. Because I had really gotten in a bad habit, rolling out of bed when my, you know, maybe when I heard my kids running around, um, and then what's the first thing I do? I check my phone, right? Maybe I'm checking emails. Maybe I'm checking social media. But the first thing I was doing, the first information coming across my brain was either a work email, and I'm immediately starting my day, hit the ground running, and I'm not stopping until I go to bed at night. Or the first thing coming across, the first information coming in my brain is relational drama or politics on Facebook, which is not a restful way to start your day. And so I realized if I'm really gonna do this, then I am not gonna look at a single thing until I've spent my time with the Lord. So I'm gonna set my alarm, I'm gonna do, so set my alarm, stumble out of bed to my coffee pot, get my Keurig, get my coffee, 
Go sit. Oh, I forgot my Bible. Okay. Go sit in this chair. This is my chair. Okay. Stumble out of bed, get my coffee, go sit in this chair. And you know what? In November, it's dark outside if you set your alarm before the kids wake up. So for those of you who get up before the sun all the time, wow, <laughs> that is hard. <laughs> that is hard. So I sit at my chair. <clears throat> I've got my coffee because it's necessary. I played a couple of worship songs on my phone. And then before I cracked my Bible open, I asked the Lord one question. And remember, I'm going to do this for 30 days and just see what happens. And I sat in my chair, and before I opened my Bible, I just said, what? Just what? Not like disrespectful, what? You know, but, but what? Not do you have something for me, but what do you want to say to me? because I knew he did. I knew in my heart he had something to say to me. So before I even opened my Bible, I just said, what do you want to say to me? What do you want me to hear? What is it about your heart that you want to communicate to me today? Because I want to hear it. And the scary thing is, I want to hear it regardless of what it is. Because I know it's going to be good. It might not be what I want to hear, but I know it will be good. So what do you want to say, whatever it is? And then I opened my Bible, and I started at Genesis, and I started it with no pl reading plan. I was just going to start in the first verse, and I was just going to keep going however long it took me to get to the last verse. And you know what happened? He spoke. And it, it wasn't like I sat down and he started a conversation with me. It was more like when you turn the radio on and it's in the middle of an interview and the host says, well, if you're just now joining us, we are talking to so-and-so and they are telling us about whatever. It was like I was joining in in this conversation that was already happening because he just, he was already speaking. He already had something for me. Zephaniah 3.17 says, the Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He rejoices over you with singing. So God was there. This conversation had already started. He was rejoicing over me with singing. It wasn't that he wasn't there. It was that I needed to come to him. And you know, he spoke, and it, be, it was the beginning of the sweetest season I have ever had in my relationship with him. It was not immediate. It was not audible. But it was like I just could all of a sudden, I just, it's like I just learned his heart for me, for other people. I mean, the timing of when he would, you know, again, I had no plan. I'm going to get to Isaiah when I get to Isaiah. And when I got to Isaiah, I read a verse that was exactly what a single female pastor in Guatemala needed to hear that day. And I had started this 15 months before that. So for me, it was not just, I'm going to read my Bible but I needed a routine. I needed the same place. I needed the same time. I needed to go at the, look at the word in a systematic way, and I just needed to open my ears and say, what? And I just believe that that is what Jesus was saying when he said, thank you, God. You haven't completely revealed everything to these people, but the only way for them to do that is through me. So thank you for that. So come. So come come to me. This is how you're going to know the Father. This is how you're going to find that rest. I'm here. I am Emmanuel, which means God with us. I am absolutely here. If you want to find that rest, come, and I'm going to point you to the Father. And man, it has been the sweetest journey. And that is what I want for everybody here. I want that for every one of you. What would it look like? What would it look like? What would 2018 look like for you? If you just said, you know what? I'm going to do everything it takes to come to Jesus, no matter what. I know he's got something good, but I'm going to come to him. I'm going to do it every day. Ooh. Ah. I think it's hard. But I'm going to do it because what he has is so good. 
And not just because I need rest for my soul, but because I want to know the Father's heart. I just get really excited about what Crossroads Church would look like if we individually said, I'm running after Jesus. And as a church, we said, I'm running after Jesus, and I'm not stopping until I hear what he has for me. Because, friends, he is worth it. And the rest that he offers is so worth it. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus.